Hear these words from Psalm 100. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him, singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever, and his faithfulness continues to each generation. Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship here at College Mennonite Church. For those of you here in this space and those of you watching and listening in other places here in Goshen and around the world. Today is a unique Sunday in our worship series. Today we are going to look at several different parables about hidden treasure. And we have different titles for different themes throughout our year. But hidden treasure, what should we call this Sunday? I think we should call today Pirate Sunday. Are you ready for hidden treasure? Okay, good. Somebody's ready. Great. So, with no further ado, let's begin with our call to worship. And this is a responsive one from left to right. So, my left, your right. My right, your left, over here. This side, then this side. We are a covenant people called to God by God, generation through generation. We are a covenant people called to Jesus by Jesus, losing our life to gain our life. We are a covenant people called to church by the church weaving together the strong and the weak, the stranger and the friend, renamed, renombrado, reborn, renacido, renewed, renovado. We gather ourselves in the community of believers. We gather ourselves to God. So let's worship God now with music. I invite you to stand and turn in voices together to number 10 here in this place.
It is time to bring our prayers and our concerns for this community to God together in prayer. I invite you to check your church email this morning for more up-to-date lists of prayer concerns and, and other things to be in prayer about for this week. A prayer update that didn't make it into the emails or into other things this week um, is for Dick Oyer. Yesterday, Dick was found unresponsive at his home. And his medical team now is working to keep him comfortable. So we want to remember Dick and his family and friends. Please join me in prayer. God of life, in you we live and move and have our being. We thank you for loving us into being through joy and a desire for shared ownership You created all that we see and know and what we have not yet discovered. We see in your work the beauty of community. And we see your design for community. And as we see it, we understand the vanity of doing anything alone. So we gather here together as your people in many different ways, and we bring you these prayers. We see peoples and regions and and countries that are not satisfied and are in disarray. We know that only your perfect love can drive out fear and bring contentment. As your church, help us to live out our identities, secure in you, so that others might see and know that only you are the path to peace. We see many changes and transitions in this world. Relationships change and shift. As one thing begins, another ends. New life is born, and old life is remembered for the wisdom it showed. And you are with us in all of the changes and transitions of life and relationships. Today we especially remember Kent Beck, and his family as they have gathered this week to grieve the death and celebrate the life of his dad, James Beck. God, when we stop and reflect on the world you have created and the creativity that you have given us as humans, the scope of our collective knowledge and energy and potential is amazing. And in that, we see how big you are. We are grateful for the way that medicine eases our aches and helps our bodies to heal. Bless Mario Wenger and his doctors with a very routine and predictable procedure this week. And give comfort and peace to Dick Oyer and his family and friends as they surround him now. God, In your presence, we feel unworthy of your love and your invitation to us to be your people of action in this world. And yet, you continue to invite us to a deeper relationship with you and a deeper love for all that you have created. So on this Sabbath day, help us to rest in you and to find delight in this world that you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Stephen Ministry is a place where people can come who are hurting. It could be from a loss of a family member. It could be a loss of a job. It's a caring ministry. It's for people who are going through crisis in their life. As a caregiver in the Stephen Ministry, I walk alongside and show Christ's love to the care receivers. Typically, the care receiver themselves comes up with the answer, but it is process-oriented, not results-oriented. We're not there to fix them. But they need a Christian friend to sound it out and to listen to them in a confidential manner. It's an opportunity for the person to just share whatever they're ready for that day, and if they're not ready, they're not ready. They, the, the key is to make them feel very comfortable. To listen to them intently, and ask her, what are your prayer needs? What should we pray for this week? And during my prayer time, I pray for her. That's the gift that uh, Christ gives us, the gift of mercy. Here you get a little glimpse of the light that Stephen ministers seek to shine amidst challenging times that people might be facing in life. And I'm delighted to be here this morning with other Stephen leaders, Barbara Thomas and Kevin Miller, as well as Maggie Harmon, our Chair of Community Life Commission, to celebrate the way that God continues to move in the midst of many caring ministries here at CMC, both formally like through Stephen Ministry or pastoral care visitors and informally in many other ways. I continue to be impressed with all the significant ways that we care for each other as a congregation and live out the call to bear each other's burdens. One of the ministries that helps us live out this call to bear and build each other up is Stephen Ministry, which is led by our Stephen Leader Team and overseen and supported by the Community Life Commission. Many significant and caring relationships have developed or deepened through Stephen Ministers meeting with those who receive their care. Over the last 10 years since we began Stephen Ministry here at College Mennonite, at least 55 people have received the care of a Stephen Minister, with a handful of those being beyond our CMC church family. Um, if you are currently serving as a Stephen minister and are here today, could you please stand? If anyone's here. Thank you. Stephen ministers and care receivers alike have shared gratitude for the sacred and holy ground they often walk with one another. <clears throat> Those who feel called to Stephen ministry or who have been tapped to consider it already bring many gifts in compassion and caring. We're really pleased this morning that Tracy Byler, Julie Gundon, and Margaret Clemens have chosen to offer their gifts in listening, caring, and supporting. Tracy, Julie, and Margaret, we are delighted that you are joining this ministry. You have been equipped to serve by faithfully completing training between August and December of last year. We give thanks for each one of you. We ask you now to join in serving God and those in our congregation and community who need to be comforted and supported as God has responded to your needs, we ask you to strive to be responsive to the needs of others. As Jesus has been a friend to you in troubled times, we ask that you be a friend to those who are burdened under the stress of daily life. As the Holy Spirit patiently listens when you offer prayers, we ask you to be a patient listener in a hurried world. As Jesus has shown his care to you, we ask you to help this congregation grow as a caring community through your own caring ministry. Are you each willing to nurture the skills that you have learned or deepened and use them in service to others to support, encourage, build up, and comfort people in their needs? 
If so, you can answer yes with God's help. Now we ask each of you, as members and participants of College Mennonite Church, to open your hearts to the caring ministry of these new Stephen ministers, as well as our continuing Stephen ministers, as they are prepared to be helpful companions along the way. We ask you to pray for them, that they will be strengthened to continue to be compassionate and helpful servants of Christ. And we ask you, the congregation, to accept their ministry when you may need help and extra support. Are you prepared to open yourselves in this way? If so, answer yes with God's help. We have given a gift of appreciation and blessing to each one. Now please join with me in a blessing together, which is found in your bulletin or on the screen. Empowering God, with your people throughout the ages, we call members of the church to develop gifts and skills for your service. Thank you for raising up these caregivers among us. We pray pray for wisdom, patience, compassion, and hope in this calling. May we grow into the mind and spirit of Christ through our service. Fill them with the love of Christ, with the love of the church. Empower them with your Holy Spirit. Bless them with joy in the work of ministry. For the gifts that the Spirit nurtures within us and the ministries to which we are each called, thanks be to God. Amen. I failed to bring my bulletin up here, but I invite you to join in singing number 298, What is the World Like? As children and families, you're invited to come forward as Sarah and some others share with us. Good morning, everyone. When I was in early elementary school, I got the most wonderful gift for Christmas. 
You know, you get a lot of gifts throughout your life and there are certain gifts that you remember. And this is a gift that I remember because I still have it. But before I reveal this to you, I want to tell you this was the late 1980s, early 1990s. So a long time ago. And caboodles were all the craze. But that morning for Christmas, my parents gave me the most beautiful box in the entire world. Now this might not look like a lot to you. You can come closer if you want to see it. But this box ended up being my treasure box. Because look, it has this really cool latch on it that you can open up and then it opens up and you think, oh, there's not much here. But look, they slide open and there's more spaces to put things. And this box became my treasure box. And all of those special things that I collected throughout the years went inside this box. And a couple of years ago, I gave this treasure box to Ava, and she let me borrow it this week, but I was so excited to see that some of my treasures were still in here. Some of my grandma's jewelry that I got after she died, that was something that I put in this box. Cool seeds and rocks and stones that I found when I was out walking. Oh, just these cool little things that you just never knew you needed to have, but you like were so glad to have it. So many things that I found and I put in this treasure box. And what I would often do when I was not using this treasure box is I would close it up and I would lock the latch and I would put it in the back of my closet to keep it safe because I didn't want my brother or sister to take this treasure box. And I have been thinking about treasure today because Jesus tells us a story about a treasure and my family is gonna help tell this story. So watch closely because it's a short story, it's only one verse in the Bible but it must be important because it's something that Jesus told us. So let's get set up. I'm gonna set the stage for you here, those of you who aren't readers yet. This is Lewis's land. Lewis is the landowner and he owns the land over here. Elliot and Ava have a shop where they will buy things from people and give them money. And my husband is the man in the story. Jesus told this story. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that is hidden in a field. When a man found it, when a man found this treasure in a field, When he found it, he hid it. He hid it again. And then in all of his joy, he went and he sold all that he had. He went and he sold all that he had. Uh, He sold almost all that he had. (laughs) And he took that money and he bought the field. (laughs) The end. Thank you, family. You can come back down. That's it. That's the story. It's one verse. Now, if I can be really honest with you, I read this story and I thought, this is kind of a shady story. A man finds a treasure in somebody else's field. He doesn't tell him about it. He rehides it. And then he goes and he buys the field with the treasure in it. And Jesus tells us that this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Do you see what I'm saying? It's kind of shady, right? Was it fair that he didn't tell the man that the treasure was there before he bought it? 
Well, that's what I thought. The good news is, is that I don't have to explain the story. Talasha told me years ago that sometimes we don't have to have an answer, we just need to tell the story. She's got the pressure of telling you what the story means. But in a little bit, Talash is gonna talk about another parable. So Jesus told this story, and then he told a story right after it that there's a lot of similarities. So when you go back to your seats, I want you to listen and think about the story that we told here, and listen to the story that Talash is telling you, and see what you hear in common with that story, and what this story might tell us about God. Can you do it? Okay, let's say a prayer. Dear God, we just thank you so much for your son Jesus. We thank you that we can be here worshiping you and praising you today. We thank you that you sent Jesus to earth to teach us more about how you love us and to teach us more about how we should love other people too. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts as we listen to your stories and try desperately to figure out what this story means. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go back to your grown-ups. preacher for today is Talasha Kaim Yoder. I invite you to join me in a prayer of blessing for us and Talasha in this time. God of surprises, thank you for the joy of discovery and being just beyond our comprehension. We ask that the words of Talasha's mouth and the meditations of our hearts give us new glimpses into who you are and how we live in your grace and love, in the places you have called us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. The breakfast conversation at our house was that we need to change up the way that we pass the peace of Christ. So instead of going side to side, we're gonna try two other things. First, uh, we will have the, the Folks in the balcony pass the peace of Christ to the people on the floor, and the people on the floor pass it back. So let's do that. And now we are going to pass the peace of Christ back and forth with folks who are joining us virtually, who maybe didn't want to venture out on the ice this morning. So people in the sanctuary, let's pass the peace of Christ. And if you are able to, you can look at the camera that's back there on the back wall. Ready? The peace of Christ be with you all. Can you hear them? We'll just imagine. Today's story, like Sarah said, is a parable. Parables are strange little nuts to crack. We are tempted to treat them like fables because that's a literary form we are well versed in. A fable has a moral to the story. Parables are not fables. They are not pretty little packages with nice bows. There's not a moral to the story. And so they're a lot harder for us to figure out what in the world to do with. Parables are meant to disturb. They are meant to knock us off balance a little bit, to prompt thought and to prompt action. 
to make us just take a different look at something. The parables that Jesus told contained stock characters. So those are characters that were recognizable to the people around him. A stock character might be like the hero or the, the, the evil villain who has um, uh, some sort of tech empire in today's world, right? Um, so they would have these sto- stock characters, and then Jesus' stories also tended to have everyday items and everyday situations. And then Jesus would take all of these stock characters and everyday things and maybe turn them on their heads or give them a little twist. Do something in those things that people already knew so that they would take a different look. Now, Jesus' contemporaries would have understood the stock characters and the everyday things right away. We live 2,000 years later, so we have an extra layer or 2,000 to scratch through. And it's only when we start to get a handle on those things that were easily recognizable to the people in the first century AD that we can start to open up the parables and get a little bit farther into their meaning. So if you find yourself reading a parable and you think, oh, that's simple, I know what that means, (laughs) you're probably just scratching the surface. Today's scripture comes from a collection of four parables, and three of those are ones that are going to be talked about in Sunday school today with children and youth. Now, Sarah attempted one of them in children's time. I'm attempting one during the sermon, so Sunday school teachers Good luck to you on three of them. That's a, that's a tough order. Today, I'm going to talk about the second parable. And we commonly know that one as the pearl of great price. Have you heard that title given to this parable? We're going to read it together here. So let's read together from Matthew 13, 45 through 46. And it starts with again because this is the second parable that's about the kingdom of heaven. Let's read together. So join me. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. You hear some mirroring with the story that was told in children's time. The word of the Lord. Let's break this down, break down the stock characters, the everyday things, and spiral a little deeper, start to scratch a little deeper into this parable. We begin with the kingdom of heaven. The writer of Matthew loves this phrase, the kingdom of heaven, and we've talked about this before, that the the kingdom of heaven, that phrase doesn't mean here's how you get to heaven, it doesn't mean here's how you get to eternal life. It's more like, here's how you can be part of the community that I'm inviting you into that lives in the God way. That's more what Jesus means when he talks about the kingdom of heaven. It's this now, not yet, that we live into without it being fully realized. And since it's now, not yet, we only live into it by catching glimpses and imagining and trying things. There's some experimentation involved in the kingdom of heaven. So, according to this passage, the kingdom of heaven is like what? Pearl. I'm hearing the pearl of great price. We talked about this at our house last night, right, Malachi? When we asked you this question, what's the kingdom of heaven like, what did you say? You said the pearl. And then we said, look again. And he said, the pearl. And we said, read it again. The pearl. Again, the pearl. And finally, Zeph couldn't take it anymore. And he read, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. Yeah, I grew up hearing this said and interpreted as something along the lines of, God's kingdom is like this pearl, so precious that we should sacrifice everything that we have for this precious pearl. It's not exactly what it says, is it? 
the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. What's Jesus getting at? Actually, there are two words in the Greek here. So we have one in the NRSV, which is the translation that we just read. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. But in the Greek, it says the kingdom of heaven is like anthropos. Any ideas what that means? Yeah, human, a man, a human. And then the second word is emperos, which is not emperor. That's totally what my mind went to. It's the root of emporium. So that's where we get the merchant. So the kingdom of heaven is like a human, a merchant. Pin that, because we're going to come back to it. Now, the merchant is the stock character in this parable. When you think of a merchant, given our two-day lens, our 2023, is that the right year? It's 2023, right? Okay. Given that lens, do you have a positive view, a negative view, something in between? Merchant. I love my downtown Goshen merchants. Many of us have very positive relationships with merchants. We might get a little more nuanced when we think in terms of Amazon as a merchant. But we don't, we don't hear merchant and think negative. However, the people Jesus was talking to did. So a merchant was not necessarily a positive thing for Jesus' audience in Galilee. An emperos was known as a person who sold people things that they didn't need at prices that they couldn't afford. And that was not seen as a positive thing. A merchant was someone who preyed on people's desires for immediate gratification, who profited off of what people wanted. And that was not seen as great. Have any of you ever been to a melodrama? What do you do when the, the stock character that's not positive comes on stage? Boo hiss. Okay, so we're going to read this like a melodrama. Ready? The kingdom of heaven is like a person, a merchant. More. Ready? The kingdom of heaven is like a person, a merchant. Nice. We'll do that again a little bit. All right. And what is this merchant in search of for his exploitative business? Pearls. Fine pearls. Pearls were of highest value in Jesus' time. Valued higher than other jewels. So do you think anyone in little Galilee had pearls? No. No. The people Jesus was talking to not only would have seen this merchant as a less than desirable character, he was peddling something they'd never be able to afford. So this merchant is in search of commodities of high value that no one really needs. It's important to note here that we're not talking about a person who is in search of the meaning of life. We're talking about a person in search of things that he can sell at high prices to people who don't need them. So the kingdom of heaven is like a person, a merchant, who, seeking fine pearls, mm, and here's the twist, this is the place where Jesus takes what is known and he makes it weird. The merchant doesn't find what he's looking for. Instead of many fine pearls that he can sell at a nice, comfortable profit, he finds a magnificent pearl. One that he apparently is very taken with. And he sells all of his possessions so that he might buy it. And it's, the language is clear here. We're talking everything. 
Uh, like, you know how Seth was making us kind of nervous? It's like that. So, children, help us answer this. When you are cold, would a pearl warm you up? Got some good shaking heads up there. Uh, if you're hungry, Ava, do you think that a pearl would give you, would fill your belly up? No. I mean, technically, you can dissolve them in vinegar and eat them. Tidbits that you learn when you're researching for a sermon. If there was a storm outside, Caleb, do you think that a pearl would give you shelter from a storm? Got a no up there, too. Yeah, it's ludicrous for this merchant to sell all his possessions to buy a pearl. The word we kept saying as we looked at this as a family was foolish. This is foolish. Seems foolish to us now. It would have been very foolish in Galilee, too. And yet, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a person, a merchant, who on finding one, oh, sorry, seeking fine pearls, Mm, who, finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all he had and bought it. What? And then the plot thickens. Remember that thing we pinned? Anthropos, emperos. If it is possible to foreshadow in one sentence, Jesus has done it. The man begins the sentence, a merchant. (laughs) Boo hiss. And he comes out of the sentence, a man in possession of a magnificent pearl. The parable says nothing about what happens after. Nothing about he stored it for a long time and lived like a pauper, and then he sold it for a great price. We can imagine that, but Jesus moves so quickly on to the next parable that we can guess that's probably not the point. The man's identity has changed. In one sentence, this man transformed. He not only sold everything for this precious pearl, he changed his identity for it. He's not a merchant anymore. He is now the man with the magnificent pearl. He's now a fool. Amy Jill Levine is a New Testament scholar who also happens to be Jewish, and she's my go-to whenever I'm preaching on a parable. She makes a compelling argument that the kingdom of heaven is not the pearl, but it's also not just the man, the merchant. She says, to reduce the kingdom of heaven to a person or a jewel is to commodify the kingdom. Rather, she suggests that the kingdom of heaven is the whole story. It's transformation. It is the foolish change of identity that happens to us when we encounter the elusive, mysterious, transcendent something. So what, what is that mysterious, elusive, transcendent something? What is the pearl that transforms us? The person in this parable, upon catching a glimpse of that, discovering that something, removes himself from the realm of wanting more, from the realm of the emporium, What would make us do that? I think it's maybe different for different people. We discover value greater than anything else in different ways. We all kind of get little glimpses of that, and when we put it together, maybe we get a whole picture. I know the church answer to this question is probably following Jesus, right? But we often need 
more specificity than that. And if we're being really honest, while we want that to be our response, an examination of our lives often reveals us to be, to be uh, people who are still hanging around at the Emporium. In, in spiritual direction, we talk about shiny objects. Those are the little sparks of divinity that capture our attention. It might be a deep desire. Shiny object can be a fleeting thought or a person or a literal path. And these shiny objects often read to us at first glance as distractions. They are things that distract us often from what we understand to be our calling, or the work that we are very committed to, the task at hand. They distract us from what we're striving toward. Shiny objects distract us from our identity, from being merchants. But often, if we have the courage and the attentiveness to notice the shiny object and to follow it, we catch surprising glimpses of God. These shiny objects can reveal to us the magnificent pearl. They lead us into transformation. So what happens if we follow the shiny objects? I find that personally very challenging. The kingdom of heaven is the transformation from merchants to holy fools, from people who chase after trophies and titles to people who rest in beauty, from individuals chasing what our culture values to a community seeking God. And so we're going to join now together in a prayer. Our song of response, number 738, if you want to go ahead and turn to that, is a prayer song, a communal prayer. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. And then the chorus, silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, spirit divine. We pray together that God will open our eyes and illuminate the shiny objects that we might be transformed in the kingdom of heaven.
because we have seen and experienced and glimpsed the greatness of God moving in our lives, it's now time to offer back to God our money and our time as an act of trust that God will use it for the good of others. So I invite you to bring your offerings forward to the baskets here, or you can give online at collegemennonite.org. And our offertory will be us singing together. So take your voices together, book again, to number 771, Enviados Somos de Dios. So let's sing and bring your offerings to God with a glad and joyful heart. Join me in prayer. God, you are here in the midst of us, grabbing our attention, calling to us gently, and sometimes calling to us a little more forcefully. You appear to us in things that we see and feel, and you come to us here in this community. I pray that you will accept these gifts that we bring today and that you will give us wisdom to use them for your work in this world, that together we can be that kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing now, Guide My Feet, and this is one that we stand if we're able to on. It's number 816, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, 4, and 6. Thank you. 
please check your church email for announcements and reminders about many opportunities and ways of connecting with each other and joining each other in ministry here in this community and connecting with people that you don't regularly see. One way that you can do that this afternoon, if you would like, is to join the youth and their families to go ice skating in Elkhart. So you're welcome to skate on the roads and join us in Elkhart. As we go from here today, may our eyes be opened to see things that have been hidden from us. And may our desire for God cause us to do crazy, illogical, and lovely things. Go in the peace of Christ. Amen.